I'm like so reactionary to this stuff. Like, it yeah. pisses me off. It bothers me. And then I, ha- I respond to it. And like, I realized definitely today I was like, I have to just fucking ignore this. Hey. Hey, what up, Nitroid? Hey, hey. Nitroid, mate. Sorry about that. I'm a little under the weather, but I think I'm all right. I just What's got going on. You got flu or? Or? I don't know what the hell it is, but, but everyone but my youngest caught it. So it's just been, I don't know. It feels like strep. Kind of weird, but you know, whatever. I've been just sleeping it off and suffering. So, yeah, okay, well, I'll see you, mate. Thank you. I'm gonna yeah, pour dude. myself a little drink here. I threw back five hour energy. This is extremely unhealthy. I do not recommend it, but this is what we're doing. Hey, I'm Fingers. Yo, it's Apache Smash. Hey, everyone. This is Days Ahead. And I'm Nitroid. You're listening to the Kojima Frequency. Yeah, me and Apache were just kind of talking about how MBG is kind of just bullshit. And just even engaging and pointing out like, hey, this guy is bullshit. You know, like the, the back oh, end no, of I the internet. Oh, no, I know exactly what like, you mean. Yeah, you're amplifying his reach and impressions. So it's just like, God damn it. Yeah, say yeah, I, I, say dumb shit thing. Uh, get smart people angry. Get dumb people excited. Question marks yeah. profit. I mean, that's basically what he does. That's his business model. And that's yeah. Apache was saying like he's he's trying to like it kind of clicked with him today. Like fuck, I need to not do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly. I, what he wants I have to. I have him blocked. I've had him blocked for months. Yeah, I just I, I only saw it because it was like a fucking screenshot that someone else posted. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't have even saw it otherwise. Uh, I did think recently. I was like, damn, he's been super quiet. And then I remember that I've got him blocked everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I muted him. I'm sure he's still going on. I mean, look, there's the thing I've learned about these kinds of uh let's let's call them snake oil salesmen snake oil Sol- salesmen, solid yeah. snake oil salesmen i call them walking tabloids but yeah they're just spouting bullshit all day and people see it by the checkout and they're like huh what's this maybe this is the episode we can finally use that title i've been, <laughs> I've been sitting on that one for ages what's that solid snake oil oh shit yeah <laughs> um but the thing i've learned about these kinds of guys and this extends from the low end to MBG to people like Young is that there is a degree to which they believe their own bullshit. You know, they're 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 using from their own supply uh, because you have to. It's the only way you can, you know, stay sane is to have that kind of cognitive dissonance unless you're truly a complete piece of shit. Yeah, because if you don't believe at least a little bit of what you're peddling then it's hard to escape that kind of guilt unless you're a total sociopath. And most people are not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure he thinks he's actually, yeah. He seems to sleep fine at night. So I don't, I don't know. That's uh, yeah. I mean, I, like it's just like a profession now, just like being a grifter, just kind of being like, I know what I'm saying. It's kind of bullshit, but you know, throw it out there. Cause it's going to get clicks. I commented on it before. And I was like, I, I, I said that like, it, you know, if, if I just tried to think if I was doing this, like I would just feel worthless when mm-hmm. I look at myself in the mirror. I would just feel I would feel so low, and it would fuck with me on a really like fundamental right? level of how I it w- it would seep into everything I do, and I would just feel worthless because of it. Um, because I, I take a lot of pride in things that I do within within gaming, and I don't want to ever lead anyone astray, especially not give people hope for something they love that's fucked up man that's like why yeah you doing that? and that's the thing they're talking about metal gear remakes and it's like bro like people are gonna get hype about yeah. that if you put something you know out there you know it's funny uh i was talking to fingers i can't remember when it was i think we were talking about game uh dev related stuff but something related to this came up and we were looking at other youtube channels that sort of shot up astronomically in a very short span of time yeah um and you, you know the, the stereotypical YouTube thumbnail, which is like crazy reaction, giant text, you know, headline that is not at all what this is going to be about, right? But, but those are the channels that blow up. And even the ones that don't lean entirely into that, where they just have like big, uh, obnoxious headlines that make something mundane sound as, sound as exciting as possible, like even that, even there it's going to help their numbers because let's be honest, it captures your eye. It makes you go, huh? 
you know, even 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 those of us who like are well aware of the game these these kinds of people play, it, it still works on some degree. Like they're they're tapping into something primal. And I was telling him like, you know, it would be so easy to lean into that and grow this show like just with something as simple as thumbnails that are more bombastic and and sensational uh you know throw some big text on there and i'm like man you know we <laughs> metal could... gear remake secret project yeah. revealed like yeah dude let's, let's seriously <laughs> oh, throw that man. on the thumbnail of this episode <laughs> um, okay <laughs> uh, we will we will do it once and we will see what happens so if you're listening to this episode we apologize and you, this yes. is for science this is for science. We're going to we're going to try it. We're going to make the most obnoxious thumbnail possible for this episode to see what happens. Well, I, I did it as a as a uh, kind of a joke and kind of a, a, a test on my own YouTube. I did it with one of my thumbnails. I posted it in the in the in the. Yeah, I see it in the chat. Like most of my thumbnails are pretty like they just kind of say what the video is. But I did it with just that one just for a laugh. And that has more than double the views of my next Son of a video. Bitch. <laughs> oh my god! It has more than double. I think. I think no. It's just the meta of YouTube is that you use clickbait, and I think it's fine to use clickbait in order to draw someone to your video, as long as the product on the other end is actually good. That that's that's my thing. Like a lot of my favorite YouTubers, um, like Asmongold, Gold, Carl Jobs, they use extremely clickbaity thumbnails and stuff and i do think that like if they didn't do that would i have actually watched their videos in the first place would i even know who they are so do you think it compromises their work that's the question no i don't i don't as long as you offer something that was worth clicking on on the other end like i don't mm. i don't care i don't care what you do to get people to click on the video as long the the annoying thing with clickbait is you click it and it's dog shit right so you would yeah. you would you were like oh yeah. you were drawn into clicking it and I think that's what people miss about 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 clickbait. It's like, oh, it's so clickbaity. But if you're what if you watch something worthwhile on the other end, then who cares? Literally, who cares? I gotta say, I just saw your thumbnail, the 007 one that you posted in our chat. Yeah, that is a work of art, my friend. Yeah, I, that's my <laughs> you friend. Be James, proud of that. that. I love yeah. it. With I, Pierce I, I, Brosnan in the, in the you got the red field. circle and the red arrow pointing at the stuff within right. the red circle. It's it's best if you use the red circle and the arrow, but it's not pointing to anything, and you're like, "What are they pointing at? Is it something I'm just not seeing?" <laughs> Unless, like, man, it's it's yeah. it's always going to be like you're you're right though. It's it's the stuff that's annoying is when they have the uh the you know Metal Gear Solid remake coming soon question mark yeah. question mark and then <laughs> the answer is you get no. into the <laughs> and you get well no it's usually like you'll get into the episode and they won't say no because if yeah. they say no you'll click off so they have to dance around it for a half hour it's almost like watching a like a like a ghost show like you know they're not gonna find one but you sit there watching the it fucking is, show the whole time oh like, my god it is it's ghost hunting <laughs> it's it's video game ghost hunting oh my god <laughs> in all these kind of like essay format content they, they just try and extend the length of the video as much as possible so they're like Metal Gear Solid remake confirmed in the thing, and then they get into the video and they'll be like, So, what is Metal Gear Solid? And then they'll right, read the fucking right, Wikipedia yeah. for nine minutes. Yeah. It's it reminds <laughs> me, I know this is not at all related, but you know what that reminds me of is anytime I want to find a recipe for something online, I will uh, yeah. I will look it up and like I just want the damn recipe, but first they'll give me like eight paragraphs on the history of pancakes before yeah. I actually get to the damn pancake recipe. You get the Pinterest life story. Yeah. Yeah. Like, dude, I know what pancakes are. So, we just uh, had another Shadow Moses Day, which is always fun. It's weird. You, you know, most people, I didn't think, knew when Shadow Moses Day was, which, if, uh, if you don't, it's February 28th. So, uh, specifically, February 28th, 2005. But it never tells you this in-game. Uh, as far as I know, I think does it does it show you in the briefing very quickly? That that, that was my immediate thought the other day when it happened. It's like I knew I knew that the the dates of the incidents yeah. were were named. I knew that they, that we had dates for them, um, and obviously I can just Google it and check the uh, <laughs> check the right. Metal Gear Wiki, right? But I couldn't remember ever seeing it in the game. I, I couldn't I, either. Yeah, I if I it's like a like a Mandela effect type thing, but I remember seeing the dates in the briefing too. 
Yeah. It's uh, I know that there are files in the game that explicitly state it. Because otherwise, I, I, I didn't know the exact date, but I knew it was February and I knew it was 2005. Yeah, I guess maybe it's so weird because with Metal Gear Solid 2, everybody knows what day it is. With Metal Gear Solid 3, everybody knows what day it is because they, mm-hmm. they make such a big deal about it and they show you front and center. So with one, it just seems kind of weird that we don't. But then again, we do. And it's strange. It's also uh, the birthday of a good friend of the show, Token Flip Guy. So if you're listening, uh, happy birthday. Yeah, happy belated birthday. Love Token. That's that guy. He is a Hideo Kojima magnet. Yeah, uh, he's met him like eight times. <laughs> I think once at a Target. Yeah. And 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 it sounds ridiculous, but this man has so many photos of him and Kojima. Like if he goes to an event, he'll sit in the chair and Kojima will be like either in the row in front of him or behind him. Uh, it's it was just crazy. I've got a photo with him. We met at uh, E3 for a quick bit. Yeah, he's he's also just like a really, really nice guy. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, anniversaries. So another anniversary is coming up is uh one year since that whole Tom Olson nonsense, which is weird to think about. That's a month from now. I don't know. Maybe I'm bringing that up too early. Uh, I mean, like you're still doing a lot better than Konami is in terms of celebrating anniversaries. So I say keep it up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking about this. It's um, I don't know if you saw or not because they were very very quiet about it, but um. The Ground Zeroes uh, servers are coming down, and that's for PlayStation 4 as well. Now, that's not the Phantom Pain, the FOBs online, anything like that, but it is the like the record keeping. That's what I was trying to like recall. I was like, what exactly is the online component yeah. to that? And I was like, just leaderboards, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's all the leaderboards, which, I mean, that's not a huge loss, but it is irritating because with with everything going on with uh, as little as there has been with the concerns over Konami doing NFTs instead of uh, game releases, it just it's, you know, it kind of feels like we're watching sort of like the fall of the Roman Empire. It's just this <laughs> slow decadence. It does suck, yeah. Like, like it's yeah. just been kind of like. Not what we're, it's not what we're actually losing. It's like what it represents for them to take it down. Yeah. And it's it's just. Uh, on that same note I did not realize that Konami did not have control of the top level domains for their three main franchises though I guess it's hard to call them their three main franchises at this point um so what I mean by that is if you go to say metalgear.com or castlevania.com or silenthill.com none of those are currently owned by Konami (laughs) Pachi's it's fucking cursor going to the link. Yeah, I'm like opening them. And yeah. Metalgear.com says a new WordPress site coming soon. An admin login. Yep. We know what the fucking Silent Hill one says. Oh right? man. Like, yeah. That's so, the most cursed. So <laughs> And Metal Gear Solid doesn't even well, pull up anything. Metal Gear Solid at the very least is still owned by Konami. They still own that domain. They're just not doing anything with it. They're not even pointing it at their at their page for the series, which is under Konami.com. But SilentHill.com, man, I just I really try to be patient with this stuff. But this one, I, I just don't know how you can excuse it. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Masahiro Ito, who was the lead artist on Silent Hill for quite a long time and is very famously the person who designed Pyramid Head. Uh, he's on Twitter. Uh, he's you can find him under at a D S K and then the number four. And he's very open and communicative with with fans. Um, and recently he tweeted, I wish I hadn't designed effing pyramid head. Now, he, he did not elaborate on this uh, and said it was not because he was not getting royalties. I mean, uh, you know, that's kind of to be expected when you're working under contract. You know, if you're an employee for a company, they hire you for creative work. You know, it's it's not really Yeah, you sign your work to over to that company, yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah. Um, so he he said he's not going to elaborate, but that was not the reason. And I don't want to I don't want to, you know, assume much because everyone's got their personal reasons for stuff. And if I had to wager a guess, though, I mean, maybe it's because Pyramid Head, who was this very specific villain. Uh, designed for a very specific story to work in a very specific way has been turned into sort of like the mascot for Silent Hill and has yep. been cheapened to a ridiculous degree. Like, maybe that's it. Because um, he doesn't even... If you go and look at what Pyramid Head actually looked like in Silent Hill 2 and compare him to, like, every modern uh, take on, on the character's design, it doesn't even look the same anymore. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. He's He's got his reason. But whatever the case, he tweeted that. And apparently... Somebody owns SilentHill.com and took a screenshot of that tweet. And if you go there, that's all there is on the page. Yeah. And they do have the the Metal Gear site like under under like the Konami domain. You know, they've got Konami.com slash MG. Yeah. That's that's where it looks like everything like actually is right now. So Well, Days had a really good point on this on Twitter and um, I'll, I'll let I'll let her kind of jump in here. But it just in terms of like business management. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I figured it's just something that you put on your operational backlog, right? Like, right. hey, you know, maybe you don't have to even maintain that. Like, just redirect the domain to that. <laughs> Can we get a redirect? <laughs> yeah, right. Like I've got domains that I've got registered. I've got maybe like four or five domains for, you know, just whatever project I've got in mind. And I get emails and I never miss them. So what's your problem, Konami? <laughs> How did those lapse? Like, even if you're not going to use them, they shouldn't have left your control. Yeah. And I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to just get on here and complain about Konami all night. That's just not uh, my idea of a good time. Uh, and, and I've said it elsewhere, but like, you know, I'm, I'm waiting uh, for the Konami redemption arc. And uh, I will I will be leading the parade on that when it happens. Like, I want to I want to see them uh, turn the ship around. I'm ready for it. They did uh, release that game. Uh, Guess of Fumadin. They uh, did send me a code for that. I played a little bit of that. It was, it's it's pretty fun. It's uh it's kind of like Castlevania meets Dead Cells kind of like it's, you know, where it's like roguelike and you can you kind of can like restart your run and get different weapons and different magic and stuff. So. And it's got that cool, uh, like, ukiyo-e art to it as well. So it, it looks really cool, um, you know, when you're doing stuff. But Now, that was a, that was a follow-up to an older Konami game for the Famicom, wasn't it? Yeah, and that actually comes with it. Um, but this is another instance of, damn it, I wish they tried a little bit harder because I loaded that up kind of excited to check it out. You know, I, I definitely didn't play it back in the day. Um, and the, like... Like the launcher menu was in English, but the rest of it was not. Oh no! And so, like the actual game, you know, is is all in Japanese, and there are fan translations, you know, because I've I've seen English versions of it out there before. Um, right. Yeah, because I was gonna say this this got uh, several releases over the years. The old one did, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it was on like the Wii Shopping Channel and and uh, a couple other platforms, but it was never localized. So so this isn't really a localization. Exactly. No, but I guess that that inclusion of the NES game is more just a bonus thing that they threw in. You know, it's I, the thing is, if you do want to play it, it it's it is kind of almost like they're going like, look, man, just go download the wrong one, the fan translation. <laughs> like if you really want to play it in English, you can't say that. But you can't here, say that. but here it is in uh, <laughs> in the Japanese form. If you want to just play through it, kind of. I mean, which I, I played a couple levels of it. It was all right. Touching on, on something we were talking about last uh, episode, uh, that's that's how my wife uh, ultimately ended up playing Mother 3. I mean, because that's really the only way you can play it short of learning Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, good old fan translation patches. I love that stuff. Like, the kind of raw passion required to go and translate a game. An and entire provide, game, like, yeah. Yeah, provide, like, the files for it. And just, like, the... And I don't think bravery is the right word, but like commitment, people are going to be so critical of you for for the choices that you have to make when translating a game. People are going to be so critical of you and you're doing it for free. Yeah. 
Well, this was something we talked about with uh, Jeremy Blaustein when we had him on, was how uh, translation is not just a, a one-to-one process. You can't just take words in Japanese, can, you know, find their English equivalents and call it a day. Uh, there's cultural context that you have to take into consideration. There's, there's art to it. Yeah, my, my first real exposure to that was uh, with Jack Clefia and Unmetal, and he was telling me how all the jokes for the game were written in Spanish. And so you couldn't just translate the joke and it would work. And they, then they had to do this for every single language because that game was like put in multiple. I think it was like six languages, if I remember right. It does seem like comedy uh, would be the hardest thing to translate, especially mm. if it relies on on yeah. puns or, you know, certain amounts of cultural awareness. That seems like colloquialisms as well. Right, right. Changing ramen to cheeseburgers. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And what 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 good came of that is like we had we had people from obviously Metal Gear Speedrunners is multiple different languages. There's so many different uh, cultures involved in that, and we actually had a French guy, French speedrunner, who during the event was speaking to Jack Lafier, and he was like, "Oh, I noticed there's an actual incorrect translation here." And he told him, and then they got it changed, and that that was awesome to see, like working live in front of me. I mean, to touch on um, on Day's example, I mean, you know, Kojima games have a fairly famous example uh, in Snatcher with Neo Kobe Pizza. How <laughs> you can go to a, to a market and buy, uh, you know, a meal to try out. And he buys one for, for, for Metal Gear as well, which is, you know, I don't quite understand how that works, but but, you know, he just rolls with it. And I guess the idea is that they took a slice of pizza, or at least this is this is how it was translated. If I'm going, I'm going from memory, but you like you take a slice of pizza and you dip it into a soup. And then it rises back up when it's done cooking. And what? it's the weirdest sounding thing ever. Um, but that was that at the time was done because the dish in the original game was something called akashiyaki. Uh which is uh it's it i guess it's like um you know a f- sort of like a fried dumpling uh with uh like octopus or fish in it and you know i guess that just doesn't carry over but uh it's it's just funny to to think about those kinds of changes um i was i was actually talking again to jeremy recently and uh the 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 topic of a company that's sadly no longer with us uh working designs came up you guys familiar with shout out lunar silver star yeah exactly those guys yeah um and it's it's funny you know they had great scripts but terrible localizations because they were essentially writing their own stuff at that point um they were just going for it you know putting putting whatever they wanted in and and I guess that's the challenge of localization. Again, not to not to sort of uh, repeat too much of what Jeremy's already said, but you know, f- finding you know finding a way to to communicate the uh, the feeling, the essence of something, the mood, uh, without changing it too much. You know, that's the challenge. But those guys apparently just went overboard and just did whatever they want. Any y'all playing Elden Ring? I've been banned from playing Elden Ring. People are once again finding out that FromSoft games are actually quite hard and quite challenging to, uh, and, and, and unforgiving, I'd say. Unforgiving to new players. There's no hand-holding experience. And we get this revelation every single time they bring out a new game. Yeah. Uh, people tend to get swept up in the hype. Because Eld- Elden Ring was like the biggest release. It has way more players than any of the other FromSoft games. The Steam charts are like through the roof on that game. Um, and the reception from critics and fans is that it's extremely, extremely good. Um, seeing nothing but positive things. But again, we're getting that. Oh, this game should have an easy mode. And then should have the objective from- markers. Yeah, you get the <laughs> from stuff. People like I would rather die than this game have an easy mode. And you know, I I, I don't play from stuff games. I am pro easy mode in games. I I, I always have been. It's an accessibility issue to me. Um, more people being able to complete your game is better, but at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not from Soft, and if they want to develop their game that way, that's up to them, right? And the sales should represent whether or not it's a good decision. I would like to play Elden Ring, but it's going to be a while. 
Uh, I've had uh, multiple friends tell me that unless I play previous Souls-like games from that that have been made uh, by From Software, then I'm not allowed because. Uh, and again, I'm not. I, I, this is this is a series I, I woefully know very little about. So I'm gonna sort of paraphrase what I've been taught, but uh, the way it was explained to me is that from Demon Souls onward, uh, the mechanics have been sort of built on top of each other, or or in reaction to the mechanics of the previous game. So whatever the the the, the typical strategy or the meta of one game is, the next game will intentionally kind of subvert that and like, oh, you you liked doing this, well now that's gonna hurt you, in a, in, a, in a sort of way. I get that, where they're coming from, but I don't see how that necessitates mm. you required to like play the games in order. Yeah. Well, like if you want to play not. Elden Ring, just play Elden Ring. Right. You know, it's, I'm it's all the get same it. sad old men trying to hold on to their lives and destroying the world <laughs> in the process. It's you know, these are just friends who want me to 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 get the full value out of it, I guess. I mean, I get what they're saying. It's um. It's kind of like I can compare it to Metal Gear and like saying like starting with MGSV and then going back to like MGS1. It's like playing that, you know, with that control scheme, it's going to be kind of jarring. But like with every game, you get kind of used to it. and You get into a flow with that game. And I think kind of the worst thing to do would, would be like to fuck up your expectations on what you're going to think you're going to have to do with Elden Ring. But by the time you get to it, it's like, <laughs> psych, you thought you could roll away like smack it's like they're not holding a gun to my head or anything you know it's yeah. i'm i'm working on no that's sakaro <laughs> i'm um i'm working on demon souls right now and i'm at flame lurker and he's kicking my ass pretty hard so oh the only from uh, soft game that i've played like and done good at is fucking ninja blade so <laughs> like yeah <laughs> it, it, every every uh souls game has kicked my ass and i haven't sat down and like you know, just put in the time to, to really learn them. But, you know, they, they definitely make you do calculated moves and you, you can kind of approach it in like a ton of different ways. Well, but. here's the ironic part. I mean, like I own every single one of these games except Elden Ring. I just haven't beaten a one of them. Yeah. Uh, my wife has. She's excellent at them. Uh, and every time I try and I get frustrated and I quit, I mean, she's the first person to look at me and say, get good. <laughs> <laughs> I've had three separate people offer me money to stream Dark Souls. Like, oh, you haven't played Dark Souls? I'll pay you to be bad at it. Like, <laughs> I don't get the obsession with watching people struggle through that game. But for me, it's like, it's career suicide. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't just stream myself being terrible at that game. Just blindfolded win. Yeah, it like Sekiro it was done blindfolded, right? The whole yeah. game by Mitra's at, um, at GDQ. We've already got people uh, playing it and like beating bosses with their feet and shit. So I don't know. Yeah, D Dark Souls has been done on the dance dance pads. So yeah, I've definitely <laughs> seen that. I love that stuff. The Dark Souls feels like it lends itself to challenge runs really well. When I say Dark Souls, I mean from from soft games. Um, lend lend themselves challenge runs really well. You can do like you know where you, where you don't like level up. You do it with no armor on. You do it with the worst weapon. There's there's so many different avenues to explore with that game. The new Game Plus systems. Fishing controller run win. <laughs> I miss my Dreamcast for a fishing controller. I remember one time my buddy beat me in Tony Hawk Pro Skater using a fishing controller. I was so mad. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. He was just that good at that game, though. He's just like doing like rotations with the fucking reel and shit. And I was like, bro. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's like I don't know how fair that really was. Actually, it's like the gimmick of like it being a fishing controller. Who is this legend getting I don't on the know, show? Eighth grade. Shout out, Brad. That's sick. <laughs> I think I think Daze is like the FromSoft expert out of what? this, right? I'm the FromSoft lore expert. I don't know yeah. shit about how to get good at those games. Which, by the way, started in Metal Gear Online. A lot of people don't know that, but I think about it every time one of these games comes out. Is get good. That was that was GG for MGO. If you saw GG and MGO, it did not mean good game. It meant get fucking good. It did. It did. Yeah. Yeah. It's our community. We're the ones responsible. But hey, if 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 journalists want to blame the, the Souls community for that, let them have it. Yeah, he can take some of the flack. That's cool. We can share it. Yeah, uh, I, I actually didn't know that until until they tweeted it. Uh, actually, I think you told me about it pr previous to making that tweet, but 
yeah, I was completely oblivious to that. It's a, it's a, a really cool fact. It's kind of sad that that's the way we treat each other in oh, online was... games, but yeah, I have, I have played Metal Gear Online, and I have to say, it is the most community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was very community, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, those those MGO two days uh, were were interesting. Uh, some of the best times and the worst times. If um, you go. Um, I was going to say, if you go back to the thread, my Twitter thread, apart from the what the fuck is MGO, which, by the way, you, can, you know, you can look at other responses and see the answer to that same question someone else posted. But aside from that, there were um, a lot of stories where people would be like, yeah, I go in and I'd use a cardboard box. And they called me a cardboard box noob. So I switched to CQC and they started calling me a CQC noob. <laughs> yeah. And I went to the AR and now I, mean, I was called an AR noob. Like, oh, no. just yep. stories like that. That sounds accurate. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, you don't, know, I don't know if I can speak on this without, without offending everyone, but I'm going to do it anyway. But Metal Gear very, very much does have that mentality of I'm so fucking good at this game. Like, And it's no surprise that the multiplayer gg meant get good there's no surprise to me whatsoever and i bet if you speak to anyone about how they were at mgo back in the day they were the absolute best player at it oh i sure wasn't i was awful it sucks that they didn't do gpg get pretty good <laughs> <laughs> the missed opportunity there if you if you were the best mgo player by the way let me know in the comments <laughs> <laughs> there were some fun times though i mean yeah if you got in with like the career players who just could headshot you in a microsecond that was awful but if you got him with just like a group of friends that's like one of the best times ever um it's funny though get good isn't the only thing that mgo started um in a way it also sort of started the modern uh let's say uh variant of battle royale games in a weird way uh in in metal gear online 2 there was a mode called um, Stealth Deathmatch where you would have up to 16 players and there were no teams and everyone would have stealth camo equipped. No one could see each other. So it was a free for all, right? And uh, after a certain amount of time, there would be this barrier that would start to close in on the map towards a random center to force everybody in closer. And it was a, it was a last man standing round. Yeah. And as far as I know, there are no other games that did that specific closing barriers type mechanic before MGO2 did. Mm -hmm. Until the whole battle royale genre just really kind of exploded. Yeah. Yep. I, I definitely can't think of another example that's earlier to that. Um, but when I uh, spoke with David Doak about Time Splitters 2, he was saying that he felt like battle royales took a lot of influence from from his game with um having like so many unlockable characters and customization options um and even even like the design of the maps and things like that he felt like they were doing that first <clears throat> probably i mean battle royale there you can you can draw threads all the way back to um god like i think like the 2000s at the earliest with with some early games that that had those sort of last man standing type setups in multiplayer uh it just it just took a while for for people to kind of put all the pieces together and make what we kind of look at now as a battle royale game the, the no one anticipated the explosive growth of it and there's there's two really good examples like fortnite had no idea that they were going to get as many players as they did get and and kind of still get now and um call of duty warzone when they developed the game they only expected it to last for a year and they did Is not it still going it. oh yeah yeah it seemed like they, they had to do like a whole they had to cut a game that they were making um they were i can't remember the game off the top of my head but they were making another call of duty battle royale game and they had to cut it because Warzone was just still phenomenally popular. Jeez. And then then they had to go and design all new content for that. Um and it like it's still it's still going now. And they just did not anticipate it at all. So what about stuff like PUBG? Is that still going strong or is that sort of? Yeah, yeah. It, it it just went free to play recently and it's right up there on the Steam charts. It's in the top five on Steam. 
man um, that's and just... it spent it spent plenty of time at number one as well so, but yeah PUBG is still absolutely massive yeah apex legends even just restarted like they're, they're adding like new characters and new islands and new modes and shit um yeah it's 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 definitely a popular genre i think another one too that a lot of people are playing is uh escape from tarkov um yeah it's absolutely huge. I remember getting a taxi drive, a taxi home once, and my taxi driver was uh, a Polish guy, and he was like, "This, this was when Escape from Tarkov was like pre-alpha, and you had to spend like hundred quid or something to get to be able to get access to the game." Yeah. And he was like in love with it, and he was just going on and on about it for the entire taxi ride. Um, as soon as I got in, he's like, "Oh, are you are you a gamer?" Because he wanted to talk about Escape from Tarkov so much. <laughs> Just say no. Just say no. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, Lord, high your power level. Yeah. Less, lessons learned. I, I've never played Escape from Tarkov, but I do flick between all the other battle royales. I've been playing Fortnite with Shane for like the last four days or something. Well, watch hey. out, my uh, my my youngest plays that with his friends pretty religiously. Speaking they're too of, good at, they're too good at it. Sorry, days. I was just gonna say. Speaking of Fortnite, can can you please f- explain why the fuck Epic bought Bandcamp? Oh god! So, oh man! Oh, man, it's such what? a new thing that I don't even have an opinion on it. Really, it's like I don't understand that at all, uh, dude. I think it's just a buyout where it's like they were struggling financially and uh, just don't, you know, they they weren't making any money. They give the artists all the fucking money. Like they, we get like a eighty five percent on all. Sides. Right. I yeah. was going to say, you've Bandcamp got stuff great. on Bandcamp. Yeah, Bandcamp was fucking great. It's just. Am I going to uh, hear Fingers music want... in Fortnite now? Yeah, and like the thing that sucks is like the website is bullshit. When you go to Bandcamp, you can listen to one. Uh... I just like download and export anything I buy off Bandcamp. Yeah, it is made more for downloading and like buying, not so much yeah. like a streaming platform. So... I wonder what. I mean, it's got to have something to do with their gaming model unless they see it as a potential. They're going to change something. If Bandcamp is not making money and they're buying it, then they see some value in it that well, that isn't there. They bought Harmonix. Oh, shit. Remember? I was, oh, I was shit. tweeting about this. I was tweeting oh. about this earlier. I was like, what the fuck? Harmonix oh. and Bandcamp are in the same. So all, all your favorite like uh, musicians, like all your favorite non-commercial muni- musicians can have dances in Fortnite. Like I, th- oh, that's gonna happen, surely. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of like licensed music in Fortnite. Um, like you can listen to like guys. Is Snake gonna show up in Fortnite? I hope so. Oh, I really like, want that to happen. I, the war in my in my eyes, if Pyramid Head and James Sunderland can exist in DVD, there's a place in Fortnite for Big Boss. Oh no. I want, yeah, I want, I want, I think Snake would be an awesome Fortnite character. Don't make me play Fortnite. Snake, please. Big <laughs> Boss, Spider Man swinging across yeah. the fucking island. Yeah. If I'll... we get the Metal Gear movie, that's going to be when we get the crossover Metal Gear and Fortnite, because that's, that's probably what they're just going to take advantage of the marketing for it. I can't fathom why Konami didn't make a Metal Gear Battle Royale game because it seems so obvious. It's perfect for it. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. Yeah, it, it'd be so great to just drop down and have to find your own equipment. Then you have all these weapons and access to, you know, you just have to kind of scrounge around. And, and yeah, Like, yeah, you've it's got perfect. this huge map already. If you've Survive got the, came out like two years later. If people didn't hate it. DLC. Why didn't Survive just have a Battle Royale mode? <laughs> <laughs> God, I would have played the hell out of that. Same, I'd probably still be playing it now. Yeah, it sucks that MGO3 is just, like, shit the bed, too. Like, that just wasn't, like, the right framework for any type of Fox Engine multiplayer, really. It, you know, I still think mechanically it was fine, but it just, it needed more stuff. You know? Yeah. It just, it never got a chance to flourish. It always seemed kind of laggy, like there was something going on with, like, the net code or something where it just wasn't, like, fully lining up. Oh, yeah, but that's just part of the Metal Gear Online experience. Yeah, I was about to say, I've always felt that way looking at, like, any Metal Gear Online stuff. I, you know, I, I think 2 runs really badly, and, you know, a lot, it's hard for me to say I've never I've never sat down and played it right, but I've watched a lot of, of other people playing it, and it just seems very, like like Finger said, like, the netcode's just not quite right. Yeah. It's not. Um, and, and I wonder how much of that is part of the... I wonder how much of that is due to just the game kind of struggling to keep up with PS3 or the other way around PS3 trying to, I think it's that for sure. Yeah. I think it's a hundred percent related to it being MGS4 and on the PS3. 
I will tell you this, uh, playing it emulated uh, is kind of amazing. It's very strange to play MGS4 and MGO2 emulated, just seeing how well those can run when they're not held back by hardware that can't handle it. Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. I mean, M M MGO2 was already sort of scaled back uh, to run better. You know, and and mm -hmm. MGS4 just, you know, I mean, there's parts of the game that, that drop to 16 frames a second, but you put those on PC and you've got the, the good hardware or, you know, you've got appropriate hardware for it. It's phenomenal. MGO2 especially because it did. It wasn't as demanding as the full game. I mean, my my PC is pretty meager, uh, relatively speaking, but, you know, I can play MGO2 emulated just fine. It's crazy. You think you could run it on the uh, on the Steam Deck? Uh, man, um, I actually do not know a whole lot about the Steam Deck. I'm not even sure like what OS that thing is running. Is it just got like Windows games or you what? can play 14? That's all that matters. <laughs> that is pretty cool. <laughs> it was it was crazy to see Gabe Newell ripping on World of Warcraft and saying that he's playing Final Fantasy 14. I was like, holy shit, he's just like me. Gabe's always been legit, though. <laughs> he, uh, his son, he got into it after his son was raging over pentamilding. So, which is, is, it's, it's a very expensive process to, to upgrade your gear in Final Fantasy. So the fact that he knew that and the fact that he understood his son, he, he went into the game to better understand his son's rage and why his son wasn't winning. Man, uh, and I respect that. What a cool guy. I mean, okay. Uh, Radical idea. Gabe, it, it's kind of a meme that he always tells people what his email address is. And, you know, he's constantly getting a ridiculous amount of email. I'm sure he he's going to see like one percent of what he gets, but he does read it, he says. Right. No, no, I, I've had a reply off him. I had a reply off him years ago. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. And I've had it replies off multiple people at, at Valve. Oh, man. Um, radical idea. Uh, maybe we could ask him to, you know, poke Konami a little bit. Is that where we're at? We're emailing Gabe Newell to fix Metal Gear. I think we might be because I'm getting desperate. I don't Holy know about shit. you guys. <laughs> I thought I thought we were at least a year off I, this. I don't want to. I don't want to spam poor Gabe. I'm sure he's got enough on his plate. But if we get if we got an email campaign going, you know, Gabe, if there if there's anybody out there who could, you know who's got enough muscle to to get Konami to start doing something, you know, get get Metal Gear on Steam, please. I mean, that would be I'll buy a Steam Deck tomorrow. You get Metal Gear on that. Steam Deck's Linux based. Let's look that up really quick. Oh, yeah. OK. Konami said, fuck, no, you're getting another skateboard. <laughs> oh my god they didn't even make metal gear skateboards and metal gear is the game with the skateboard, skateboard game in game. it it's right there what are you doing i think Ugh. part of the reason why we are so upset about this is because i feel like it's human nature to hate it's human nature to to react worse to apathy than to hatred because at least with hatred resentment you get something out of it like right. you get a reaction with like this shit it's just like you're not even putting their like they're not even putting a foot forward. They don't give a fuck. Right. I mean, what's what's the old statement? Like the opposite of 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 hate yeah. isn't love. It's apathy. Uh, it's right, apathy. Yeah. Man, because yeah, yeah, no love for Metal Gear. It sucks. Kojima's got some love for Metal Gear lately. He's been oh uh, yeah, he's been tweeting the fuck out <laughs> a lot about MGSV and and even PTs brought oh, up no. recently. Are people drawing conspiracy threads to it? I mean, uh, no, nah, he was just saying he was kind of like reminiscing on the whole like Moby Dick Studios thing. And then uh, he said he was a little more careful with uh, his PT trickery. But. Uh, careful, uh, but not fully away from it. Yeah, he, he says, uh, I used to do something like this a lot. <laughs> He's just like That's... fully aware. He's like, yeah, I ruse. What's up? OK, so I wonder then, did that get him in trouble? Uh I don't know. I mean, this is pretty much him openly. I've, I've got it uh, over in live chat, but this is pretty much him just openly saying like, yeah, I was fucking around. I knew what's up. 
And that's fun. I mean, yeah, with with PT, it was a lot more low key than than MGSV and Moby Dick Studios was. Yeah, Moby Dick um, was pretty like bombastic with, you know, it's like, here's this new studio with a new high profile game. We're going to show it at. God, what was that first shown at? I think the Game Awards. Yeah, TGA. Yeah. But again, people figured it out in like 15 minutes. Yeah. So it's that's part of the reason that I've never really bought into like the 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 ruse cruise mentality is because the stuff that he has done that you can, you know, absolutely prove has always been solved very, very quickly. Yeah. And and to think that he's doing some sort of Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code sort of stuff. It's just. Like, like, yeah, he's playing games with you occasionally. He's being coy, but but you're not going to like you're not going to crack some deeper meaning here. You know, he's he's selling video games, people. But that's nice to see him talking about it again. There was a while there uh, that he just would not say a thing about Metal Gear. So it's nice to see that he's sort of opening back up now and he's been talking about it more. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what I've been taking from it at the most. Like, I don't want to get into. Yeah, any ideas, especially after everything that we've dealt with with these rumors before. But at the very least, we can appreciate that, you know, he's taking something he created from a hard moment or a hard place, and now he's able to appreciate it. Yeah, it's, you know, time heals all wounds. I do wonder if he would ever work with Konami again. I mean, I suspect he would. He is a, a, a consummate professional. He'll help him design a skateboard. It almost seemed like there was like NDAs in place where like he almost had like a gag order and couldn't talk about it for a while. Cause yeah, he absolutely did not mention it for a long time. And then he might've had a non-compete clause for a while. Yeah. That might explain yeah. why it took so long to get his studio off the ground. You know, it was, what was it? It was about a year or so after he left Konami that he made his announcement. And part of that is probably just, you know, he needs the time to set it up, but yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of companies like that will sign you to a no compete clause for at least a year uh, after you leave. So I, I feel like Konami would struggle to prove that he's competing with anything. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sorry, that's, that's like kind of harsh. But at the same time, like they're not competing in the same space video game wise that they're, they're just not. We you know, and we could say that, you know, we could say otherwise if Konami was still making games like they used to but they're not yeah absolutely yeah absolutely we could and no a no compete clause would make sense even um but it just it just doesn't well it's it's more just like we don't know what you might do and we just want to cover our butts you know mm -hmm. it's like god i can't remember what it was and i don't know if they even still have this in place but uh, a while back i was reading about amazon and their game development studio and how uh they had some sort of a, a rule in their in their uh, job contracts that prevented you from working on anything on your own and anything you did work on outside of company time was their intellectual property. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. I looked at that. I was like, dude, I'd never work for those people. Usually. I don't, I don't know how it is for Amazon, but a lot of companies have rules like this. And if you work on something, you can then buy the rights to it from the company and they'll sell it you quite, quite, quite cheaply. They shouldn't have that um, right in the first place, though. It's, it's more towards, like, if you do it on their grounds with their computers. Oh, um, okay. So, but for that's... like, Wolfenstein was created on other people's computers, which they stole at one point using Thermite <laughs> to break into the offices. <laughs> that, that really happened. Look that up. <laughs> that's but kind like, of amazing. So, technically, you know, they should... I think it is Apple, right? Apple computers were stolen by uh, John Carmack and john romero um and so apple technically would own wolfenstein right because they did it with their kit but I, it's not the way it went down but that 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 sort of thing if you use their their kit their offices which happens all the time right if you work somewhere and you have like two you know two hours you're in the office you could work on your own project yeah um but under like law and contracts and things like that the company owns that intellectual property i'm sure with amazon it's much more sinister but it's kind of funny now that you mentioned amazon like i don't hear anybody talking about that game anymore i just hear lost ark i don't know what it's called lost world 
New, new World. New World, yeah. <laughs> new, new World is a classic example of like companies always want to get, the, they're always like, oh, get the game out and we'll fix it later. You can't do that with MMOs. You get one shot with an MMO. Player base comes in, they look around, see what's there. And if anything's wrong, they leave and they never come back. They just go back to the character that's in a better quality game that they have more stuff invested in. Yeah. It's, you know, your story, though, about uh, John Carmack and, and those things reminded me of another famous one that had to do with Apple. It was uh, it had to do with with the graphing calculator that was included with a lot of the early Apple uh, computers. I actually don't remember if it's still included or not. I haven't checked, but uh, it was a pretty popular app for 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 you know just anybody doing math stuff because it had all these cool visualizations and stuff um but these two guys uh ron avitzer and greg robbins were uh i think like ex apple employees they'd been working on this project were trying to get it done and for some reason or another they got let go i'm I'm, I'm going from memory here so uh, i might get some details wrong but they were so committed to this project and Apple at the time was so lax about things and, and, and they were they were growing faster than they can sort of keep up with their growth. So they had all these like holes in their security and all these blind spots to projects being done. And these two guys were like, well, we really want to finish this project because we really like Apple and you know, it sucks we got laid off, but we want to make the best thing we can. So how about we just keep working on it? And so they just like kept their badges and kept coming to work, even though they weren't getting paid. And they were able to, like, get a, a, a like a part of the building and their own hardware to keep developing it. And then I think like over a year or so, uh, they were just living off of savings and developing this thing completely free and, and not on the payroll. Uh, and, and like they were even going out and being like, hey, can we get some members from X team to come and help us with this project? And, <laughs> and managers were like, oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, he's he's documented the whole story online. Just look up like Apple graphing calculator story and you'll find it. But it ended up getting finished and it was amazing and everybody loves it. And, and it was included for like years. Uh, and as far as I know, like nobody ever figured it out until they were like, yeah, we did that. <laughs> it's just kind of incredible. That's actually fucking awesome. That's actually so awesome. I would never uh, go to work for free. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe if it was like my stuff, but like at that point, you're not. It's not. Is that really free? I don't know. Now you got me thinking about that drug dealer game on my graphing calculator. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like, what? God, did everybody have that? Of course. I mean, if you like had a child, would you had that? I'm just kidding. Yeah, I uh, what are you talking about? There oh. was uh, on. <laughs> Like, old, like MS DOS level fucking game, pretty yeah, much. Days yeah, days take it away. In America, you know, for our high level math courses, you're like required to have this tech. It's this company, Texas Instrument TI 84. It's a graphing calculator. And one, you were allowed, you were able to program sort of functionality in there. It was mostly supposed to be used for functions and graphs and shit, but games were made. And one game in particular was like a drug dealing simulator. Where it was like sort of like a lemonade stand esque game, except that you were dealing drugs, and instead of quitting, you had the option to kill yourself. <laughs> I forgot about that. I I I have to play this. Like, I've never I've never heard of that. It was pretty much just like buying and selling at different rates, and being like, oh, yeah. well, this is this much here, and then like you drive to a different places. Like this is how much it goes for here, and you got to like decide whether to buy or sell certain things. Oh, Stick RPG has a function like that. Drug Wars, that's what you, it called. It was yeah, called. if I remember right, you couldn't. It wasn't like you could just you know hook your calculator up to your computer and get it that way. Although I bet you could, but most people got it from other people who already had it because you could transfer stuff from one TI-84 to another, right? Like, I got it from a, some from somebody else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had the little link cable. Yeah. It's like trading it Pokemon. Like trading Pokemon, yeah. God. That's all I use that thing for. I sucked at geometry. No, but uh, I remember a Flash game, Stick RPG, it had, like, a basically that, and I wonder if it's, like, a homage to that even. It had, like, a, a drug dealing system that was just like that. I'm curious now. I'm going to definitely look into that after today's episode. I'm pretty sure you can find an emulation of it pretty easy, like a web browser-based emulation of yeah. it. Yeah. Probably on Newgrounds. Well, I don't know. Is my computer good enough to emulate a T84 I calculator? I don't know, man. <laughs> RTX enabled. Were they, were they solar-powered, or did they have battery? <laughs> no, these were, like, major, like, 
crazy big calculator. It was the only way you could get anything close to a game system into class and get away with it. And it was so, such extortion too. I'm sorry. Like, oh no, it is absolutely was. Them shits cost like they've been. They've cost the same price since I was in school, and that's because it's the same standard. It made you get that like as soon as you hit algebra. It was like required to have that calculator. Mm-hmm. It was bullshit. And you couldn't get the alternatives. You had to get that one. The class required it. Even if it had all the same functions, you had to get that one. It was. That does sound like a racket. No wonder you had Drug Wars as the video game on there. Um, like, did you guys not take your Nokia N-gages into school? <laughs> God, you get your ass whooped Damn, if you, you had said, an N-gage. You said that so straight that I almost <laughs> took it seriously. Uh, my friend Connor actually got Nokia Engage. I remember the day he got it and brought it in school. That is, that is a horrendous gaming device. Did he get his ass beat? No, no, no. It was probably the most technical thing in the school at the time. There were there wasn't many gamers like uh, at my at my high school. I had uh, I never brought it to school, but I had a GameCom. I had a GameCom. A We've had this conversation. Yeah, we did. The only thing I ever brought to school game wise uh, was my Game Boy Advance SP. Because it was so small, I could just tuck it away. Those things were awesome. Yeah, still awesome now. I've got a few of them. I'll never forget the summer in high or the winter break in high school when, like, it was like the year or the year, the second year my school had, my high school, it's like small rural high school, implemented Wi Fi. Um, oh, and no. then everybody that winter got like PSPs and DSs and shit. And like everybody came back and like, I don't know. I don't know how familiar. Like, I don't know how familiar folks are with how like IP leasing works, but <laughs> there were so many devices that the school network ran out of IP leases. Oh my god! And like, <laughs> school That's machines awesome. couldn't get on the network while we're <laughs> like watching, like going on the internet on our PSPs and shit. So Did they start like times. blacklisting MAC addresses, or like how'd they handle it? They just added a Wi-Fi code, and the people, the kids who worked in the IT, found that out and passed it around. So, start selling it. We were the first generation of kids that had uh, iBooks given to us. It was like this, like experimental thing where they were kind of just giving everyone an iBook, and uh, they all had a you know a network at the school for everybody to kind of like upload and download homework for. Like, but that basically just turned into like a hosting server for ROMs and, and ISOs and shit. Wait, yep. Okay, <laughs> wait, like, like an Apple iBook or is that something else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was like a, the cheap iBooks, like, you know, not, not, not anything crazy, but. Shit, man. What school yeah. did you go to? It was in Richmond. Um, you know, there's like the entire county pretty much all got it. I never and, got uh, anything in class. Yeah, that's, that's like all we did was just play like PS1 ROMs and shit <laughs> just hang out and play resident evil 2 in history class that sounds amazing i mean i did have a laptop that i would bring to school uh and use at lunch and study hall and yeah i pretty much just spend the whole time playing rpg maker it was just cool using the school server to distribute roms <laughs> just like all right guys it's in this folder <laughs> and then everybody would just download the whole folder and play fucking super mario all-stars it made me so mad you want to hear a funny story about schools and and computer ineptitude uh, one year in computer lab, I realized that there was a, uh, a key logger installed on one of the systems there. Oh, no. And I, I, cause I found the log and I was looking at it and I was like, oh shit, I can see the password for the admin system. And this can get you into the grades system and everything. Right. And so I reported it. And I, I got in trouble. I got suspended because they thought I was the one that put it there. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I'm like, are you kidding me? I literally, I found this. I told you about it. I'm showing you like, uh, you know, aptitude with computers. You should be encouraging me right now. Aren't you the teachers? Don't you want me to do better? Everybody has that story in school where they tried to think outside of the box and then that shit got shut down. And then you realize that school is fucking awful sometimes no we're kind of we're talking about personal lives on this episode a lot (laughs) but that's okay that's okay there's not a whole lot going on right now we're sort of in between everybody's playing elden ring and some people are playing horizon forbidden west i played it for like 
an hour and got really bored and just stopped. But yeah, uh, that, that story and dialogue is just ugh. not um, that good. No, I mean, that's it's it's a cool game because of the enemy design. But when they just sit there and talk and talk, I think Rocco was saying it on the Mega 64 podcast. It's just like, I'm not here for this. Just whatever. Just on with it and skip, 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 mm. skip. You know, it's like one of those games where you just really don't care what's actually going on. But the gameplay is fine. So it's, you know. Rocco seems like he'd be a fun guy to talk to. Yeah, he does. I really need to play that game because at speedrun marathons, they always put MGS3 either before or after the Horizon games. So there must mm. be something there. Like, I need, I need to play those The gameplay games. is fun. Like, when you get in an engagement with each enemy, like, you can't just hit it with your spear. Like, you actually you have to sit there and kind of, you know, approach them and hit their weak points and stuff. It's, it's you know, it's a fun gameplay loop, but I just... I didn't care enough about the story to like keep going through it. I was so bad because it seems like <laughs> Horizon always like it comes out a week is the precipice before like some crazy <laughs> game that comes out a week later. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and granted, I don't think Elden Ring is gonna get as big as like Breath of the Wild, but you know, fucking Horizon disappeared after uh Elden Ring came out, at least on yeah, my socials. It did. Yeah. It's it a really gorgeous did. game though. I mean it's very pretty, yeah. The, it's, it just it, it got wiped out. That's that's the thing with games, man. If it's it's like they just or it's like the social thing for the week, and then they just disappear these days. It's like, oh, there goes that one. I I don't know if they do it on purpose to piss me off, but like the marketing is always, wow, finally women can see themselves in a video game. <laughs> it's like have you just never played any. Like not that not that that more is is bad or anything, but I just hate. They're saying it this is like, the first time. That yeah, there's ever it's been. the first yeah. one. <laughs> it's just right, not it's the points case at, at the all. boss. They're like, hello. Yeah, it, it, it you, is hilarious when people out themselves and never seen a woman before. When they're like, oh my god, what is this? What did you see that stuff with uh with like the hairs on her face? Uh, her peach fuzz. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. To say it's a beard. <laughs> oh, like, that oh, is. Bro, the... You've never been next to a girl. Holy shit! I know that was my thought too. Like. <laughs> Like, geez, tell us you've never had a girlfriend without telling us you've never had a girlfriend. That 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 was my favorite one. Babies have that, dude. Every that is a human <laughs> characteristic. You've just never been that close to a human being before. Oh my god. Uh, on that note, though, of like Horizon sort of dropping off. I mean, how much did that game cost? Do you have any? Does I I actually don't know. Do do any of you know how much? Like, what the budget for that was? They had From to pay for looking. Lance Reddick, so. It, I mean, are, are, like, are they still using the Decima engine, for example? Like, like engine development is always a big upfront cost when making a new game if you're not using a pre-existing engine, so. I'm seeing the budget says 110 million euros. Oh, so. my gosh, so a lot. Okay, so here's the problem with that. Like, I wonder if they're going to make that money back and when it leaves that sort of cultural consciousness behind, you know, yeah, where everybody's talking about it for that period of time, but then if it just sort of drops off... Um, Sean Layden, who was uh, CEO of of Sony or of PlayStation, I can't remember exact his exact exact job, uh, job title, but he was basically in charge of PlayStation until Jim Ryan took over. And I mean, I always liked Sean Layden a lot. That guy's legit. He he made a lot of sense. He made a lot of good business decisions. Uh, he actually played games and and liked a lot of weird cl like classic stuff. I mean. I was really sad when he left um, and he gave an interview recently where he was sort of talking about this phenomenon of game budgets exploding, you know, especially as as like PS5 and and Xbox Series S sort of came into the picture because they were already big. And every time the generation changes, they just get bigger. Right. And you look at a game like Horizon or Gran Turismo 7 or any of these big budget titles. Uh, and how much money is being poured into them? How big of a risk is it for the studio? Um, yeah. You know, if it doesn't do well, how much are they losing? And and to be fair, there is an element of this game is being made to sell the system, not so much to make profit on its own. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can make that argument. But, yeah, look up this interview he did recently about where he sees the industry going and how he thinks that, like, this idea of sort of just pumping tons of money into these big-budget games to to compete in these hyper-realistic, super triple-A sort of spaces is just killing creativity. Um, oh, yeah. 
I mean, yeah. And I it's mean, also just not profitable. I mean, you've just got yeah. a lot of people just switching to the, the games of the service, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, I think model. there's two ways you can make money in games. And, I'm, you know, of course, I'm no expert. But um, if AAA games are, are such a big gamble, you know, I, I've seen two ways that people can make games. And, and all game development is a gamble. Any Any entrepreneurial endeavor is a gamble, ultimately. But it seems that companies are going one of two directions. Either they're doing, like, the cheap mobile sort of games as a service type thing where it's as, as heavily monetized as possible, right? Or they're or they're looking for ways to make uh less expensive, more creative games that stand out more. You know, spend like invest more in the creativity than in the graphical fidelity, right? Yeah. And 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 his argument in the in the article to to kind of paraphrase is that we should be going towards that model more where people get more creative and they, and you know, drop the budgets down, get more creative instead of trying to do all these insanely expensive things. Uh, and you know, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if horizon gets a third game. If it doesn't, I think we know why. Right. Yeah. I mean, this game, it really didn't leave any big impression on me. The, the first one did, you know, the first one I was definitely like, yeah, I enjoyed that game. But this second one, I was kind of like, all right, what are we doing here? There's not too much different going on here. It was kind of just more of the same. And uh, I think when you compare that to a game like Elden Ring, you're just going to more people are going to lean towards. Yeah. You know, I mean, Elden Ring is not it's not a game that shoots for high graphical fidelity. You know, it's a pretty game. It's got a lot going on for it visually, but they're not dumping these enormous you know, uh, uh, art budgets into it. Like all these other AAA devs are, you know, that's not their goal. It's like, it's crushing the launch sales of like the other souls games. So like this game's selling like crazy. Yeah. Like, so what, I mean, these guys need to get the message, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Gamers don't necessarily need peach fuzz to have a good time. We just kind of, yeah. Need a, uh, let's shake up here. And it is impressive. Boring though. story. Yeah, I mean, I, I yes, look at it, that. It's kind of like you said, it's like it's technically impressive. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm just not having a great time with it. And it's just kind of more of the same old. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to try it. I mean, OK, caveat to what I've said. Uh, <laughs> you better believe I pre-ordered Gran Turismo 7. Yeah, <laughs> but which is which is like very much a triple A hyper fidelity game. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's a little different, though. Uh, Gran Turismo has always been sort of like driving as an art in a lot of ways, or cars as an art. I I loved those games when I when I was younger. I loved like three A spec. Um, I'm thinking yeah. of getting the new one. But why is with the Metal Gear fans all all like playing Gran Turismo? Like D D Limes is talking about dedicating an entire day of his stream to it now. <laughs> oh seriously? He, like, he, he, yeah, he loves Gran Turismo. Maybe it's just like a PlayStation fan like crossover thing with like a lot oh, of Metal yeah. Gear people Gran having that yeah. and Gran Turismo two on their PlayStation. It's like all right. No, now that I'm thinking about it, it, I've seen that too actually. Huh. I I like the look of the military vehicles in in Gran Turismo. Okay, so question for people. Uh, if you're if you're on Twitter or if you're listening on YouTube or just wherever, uh, you know, write a comment, shoot us a line. If you are a Gran Turismo fan and a Metal Gear fan, which if you're listening to this, you probably are. Uh, <laughs> what's the cro like what is responsible for the crossover there? What what sort of draws you to these two? Do you think there's a relationship there? I'd be interested to hear because I really don't know. Now I'm just picturing some dude that's like, yeah, I don't actually like Metal Gear. I just really like Harry Nitroid's voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I'm sick, so I got the sexy voice. Oh, he's good. Like, whoever it is, they're going to be, like, really happy with this week's episode. Oh, jeez. Uh, did we mention the art? Like, I feel like an asshole if we haven't. Oh, man, yeah. We have not talked about it yet. I was definitely going to bring it up. I was going to do a segue into it, but someone cut me off. I was like, when you were all like, oh, we've been getting really personal, I was going to be like, oh, speaking of personal, it was really nice of uh, Fingers to... Got some really cool art made of us. I feel like people have been taking me more seriously on Twitter since I changed my profile picture to that. Like, uh... Yeah, we all got this badass art made by uh, Century Wizard. He's uh, he's been he's been pretty much I don't want to say emulating like in a derogatory way, but he's pretty much got this Yoji Shinkawa style 
down, but it, you know, he's, he does his own thing with it. Um, it's an homage, right? It's like, I yeah. love this artist so much that I want to draw in that style. Yeah, like I say it in the most complimentary way, like he's got it down where he can draw like any, uh, pretty much any franchise in, in that same style and, and nails it. Uh, he made me look way cooler than I actually am. <laughs> Yeah, what did you say, Days? It looked like we were about to like. Uh, oh, I don't know. We we're about to, to like delegate deliberate, some delegate shit. some shit. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. About to redefine the global stage. We're looking yeah. like the Patriots. Yeah, for real. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to Century Wizard for all the new art on the Kojima Frequency. Uh, we got that on our on our Twitter, and we have a, a little bit more to share too that we'll uh, we'll be sharing here soon. So. Yeah, I might. Uh, God, I kind of want to use that as the thumbnail now, but now we're we're torn between the the earlier one and this. No, we already committed to the other one. We can't. Um, but yeah, new it's, set uh, of patriots revealed. New set, <laughs> right? MGS six villains revealed. Oh my god! It looks like Shinkawa art. It's got to be real, bro. Oh jeez. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll include a link to it uh, on YouTube or wherever. Yeah, he's um, on uh, Twitter and Instagram at uh, century underscore wizard. So. But by the way, because uh, I know we're getting kind of close to the end here, uh, I'm going to be that guy for a second and say that um, we really want to find ways to grow the show. We've been talking a lot about different uh, approaches for doing that that won't just be, you know, making all our thumbnails clickbait and, and sort of going that route. But uh Simple things like if you listen on on Apple podcasts, if you listen on Spotify, if you listen on YouTube, um, I know everybody hates hearing this, but but, you know, leaving a review, subscribing, liking all that stuff, it it tells these algorithms that people are interested in what we're doing. So if you like what we're doing, you want us to do it more. Seek you see that like button. All right? Oh, just my go God. Is that going to do the three punch combo <laughs> the punch punch kick on that like button? Oh no! And then, and then YouTube will call you a CQC noob if it yeah. the NGO is an indication. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> That's gonna be our thing now, isn't it? <laughs> CQC that like button, bros. <laughs> God.